morning, how about you? Look at somebody and tell them, I'm glad to be here this morning. Yeah, I, I want to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Glory to God. The word of the Lord is going to be found. I have two portions of scripture, Romans chapter number eight, and then we'll be in John chapter number 14. Romans chapter number eight. And then John, the 14th chapter. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Romans 8 and 14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Verse 15 says, The Spirit you received does not make you slave. Has anybody received the Spirit this morning? Yeah, I'm thankful for the Spirit of God. So that you live in fear again, rather, the Spirit you receive bought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. John chapter number 14 and verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus talking here. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm thankful for my Helper today. Yeah, I'm thankful. And it's a couple other people that's thankful for their Helper today. He will teach you all things, bringing them back to your remembrance, the things that I've said. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Family, for the last few weeks, we have been looking at a short series, and uh, we entitled the series The Champion's Creed, because I believe that all of God's children are champions of the faith. Oftentimes, we don't feel like we are champions, but the reality is that God has declared to us that we are more than a conqueror. I dare you just to say that and declare that over yourself. I'm more than a conqueror. Yeah, somebody say it. I'm a winner. I'm God's champion. We started off this series of messages entitled, All I Do Is Win. We discovered that what separates champions from uh, everyone else is attitude. And in order to maintain a winner's attitude, that we need to practice the praise principle. That we need to practice right praying and right thinking and right living. Last week, we discussed that in order to be a champion, we need to understand and to resolve that without pain, there would be no gain. And that just because I have a knockdown doesn't mean I have to be knocked out. Uh, this morning, family, I want to conclude this series with a message that is entitled from a phrase that You've probably heard if you've ever watched any type of athletic event or maybe you have uh, been in a commentary where someone was talking and they said that this person or these people, these teams are in the zone. He is in the zone. She is in the zone. Uh, the team today seems like they're in a zone. This morning, I want to use for a subject in the zone. Look at the person next to you and tell them, stay in the zone. Yeah, stay in the zone. Uh, family, in 1965, the Florida Gators football team was a mediocre team at best. They were struggling in the heat to play the game of football. They were in the humidity of the deep south. The players were fighting a, uh, an opponent tougher than they had ever fought before. And this opponent was an opponent within and of themselves. 
They had great difficulty finishing the game in a champion-like form because they were dehydrated. So there was a team of university doctors that developed a carbohydrate electrolyte beverage that kept the team properly nourished throughout the game. And before the eyes of thousands of fans, the team came in the second half and performed uh, with an improved performance. And in 1967, they won the Orange Bowl. Many of you may know this beverage because it is on every sideline around the globe performing at their best. Of course, we know this beverage as Gatorade. Now, you might be asking, Pastor, what does Gatorade have to do with me living out my faith in Christ? Why do you bring up this story of how the Florida Gators received this uh, Gatorade beverage to finish the game? Well, the answer is simple because the Gatorade gave the Florida Gators an edge over their opponents. They had an advantage that the other teams did not have. Christians have an advantage to living out their faith in champion-like fashion. Uh, You may ask, well, what is that advantage? It's not more or less what, but who. And who is the Holy Spirit that gives us an advantage to live out our life in championship form? In other words, it's more or less the uh, athletes were asked at the Florida Gators, is it in you? Is, is the Gatorade in you before you get on that field? Is it in you? Before you get in the game, is it in you? And today, what I'm asking this body of believers and those that are watching is, is it in you? Is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you? I know you think it's just for you to shout and just for you to have a good time and feel some goosebumps, but I'm submitting to you today that the Holy Spirit has been given to you for an advantage in your everyday life. The Holy Spirit has been given for an advantage for you to live out this Christian faith in your journey as you walk through the day-to-day living that you walk through. When I talk about living in the power zone, I'm talking about living in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit's power. You see, there are two types of people walking on this earth. There are those that are moving to the rhythm of the Holy Spirit and those that are dancing to the beat of their own drum. Uh, Let me tell you that being in sync with the Spirit isn't about how long you've been in church and how deep your theological knowledge runs. It's about are you allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you on this journey that we call life? Because Jesus left and he said, I'm not going to leave you without some help. I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. I'm not going to leave you without an advantage. But the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you an advantage that you can live out this day-to-day life. But you got to be in the zone. Let me tell you, being in sync with the Spirit isn't... The fact that you would need a spiritual PhD to hear from God. The Holy Spirit is not using complicated codes. He's speaking your language, but he's just waiting for you to tune in to hear what he's saying. Let me break it down to you because having the Holy Spirit uh, isn't like having a VIP backstage pass. You know, if you have a VIP backstage pass, you get to go where only the, a select few get to go. And you can get in this area. But having the Holy Spirit is like having an all-access pass, that there is nothing that is limited to you, that you can do everything, that you can be everything, that you can go anywhere you want to go as long as I have the strength and the ability of the Holy Ghost, I can do everything that God has said I can do. As long as you said yes to Jesus. Let me ask you, have you said yes to Jesus? Yeah, have you said yes to Jesus today? Today, as we dive into what it means to walk with God and be actively led by him to be in the zone, Tell your neighbor, stay in the zone. 
I want to define what I mean when I say a Christian being in the zone. What I mean by a Christian being in the zone, it is when, <clears throat> excuse me, your natural abilities and your acquired skills and your spiritual gifts all come into alignment by the direction of the Holy Ghost so that you can do what other people cannot do, that you can be what other people cannot be, that you can have the advantage to live out your Christian faith. Because watch this, being led by the Spirit isn't about following a set itinerary, but it's moving in sync with the heartbeat of God. It's about not you just wandering through life hoping that you end up in the right direction, but it's you being divinely navigated. I don't know about you, but I want every step that I take to be navigated by the Spirit of God. I don't want to make a move unless I'm moving by the drumbeat of God. I want God's Spirit to direct me. I want Him to guide me in every step that I take. I just wonder, does anybody have the Holy Ghost today? But see, watch this. In order to live in the power zone, we must first understand who the Holy Spirit is and why God wants us to live and operate in the power of his might. Because many Christians today don't acknowledge the Holy Spirit, much less live by the empowerment that he provides. The Holy Spirit has become a taboo topic within the church, and we'd rather talk about all different types of other things and uh, all different types of things that's going to make you feel like I'm a good person and I can do good things, but not the miracle, wonder-working power and baptism of the Holy Spirit. The modern-day church, hear me, has substituted the Holy Spirit for cappuccino machines and movies screens and some churches have even removed the altar because I don't want to seem too churchy because I want these seeker friendly people to come to my church so we don't want to talk about the Holy Ghost we don't want to talk about the power of God we don't want to talk about how people can be changed by the Spirit of God let me come to church and just have a good time. And it's not that movie screens and things are bad, but I am firmly believing this morning that where the church is going is grieving the heart of God because the church is becoming a place where people can be entertained in Jesus' name. Yeah, as long as you perform good for me, you sing my song, you make me feel good, but you don't challenge me. You don't tell me about the things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. Don't tell me about the way that I'm going and I should not be going. As long as you entertain me, it'll be all right. I'll bring my money, I'll fellowship, I'll stand in the congregation, but don't you tell me about the Holy Spirit's power to change my life and set me on a course that I'm supposed to be set on. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit is the power behind the church today. The promise that God has given us that he would empower all those who believe. He said it in Joel chapter number 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision and also on my men servants and maid servants he said I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh this is the exact same passage that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost uh, but today we don't have people that's moving by the power of the Holy Ghost yeah, some people that's supposed to be saved, they don't, uh, they come in church and they just sit there like, I don't even know what's going on. And my question is, are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Or let me make it a little bit more plain. Are you living in the zone? Are you in the zone where God wants you to be? 
Because watch this. The bottom line is God's promises are not broken. God promised us his spirit to live and empower us. This empowerment, this infilling, this baptism and gifts of the spirit did not die with the apostles. If he had died with the apostles, then God's promises would not come to pass. And the God that I serve will never break a promise. He said, I don't make a promise and then break it. He said, everything that I say, it's going to come to pass. I'd rather not say it because the time that it comes from my lips, it's going to come to pass. God wants us family to live in the power zone. Notice I said live because God wants us to dwell and remain in his sustaining power. This zone is not a place to vacation and to visit where unfortunately a lot of people even in the body of Christ only visit his presence every now and then. Oh, they go on a vacation to a conference, to a special meeting to get in his presence. But God says, I want you to live every single day of your life in my presence. I want you to wake up in my presence. I want you to go to work in my presence. I want you to handle your business in my presence. Drive your car in my presence. Somebody shout, Lord, thank you for your presence. Because watch it, if we are not walking day by day in the sustaining resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, then all we're doing is becoming church people. And then what we're doing is perpetuating and raising up a generation of church people who never experience a true move of the spirit and the power of God. Where we know about God and we know about the church, but we never experience and uh, uh, experience the manifested presence of God in our lives. Where lives are radically changed and people are healed. I want to see where cities and nations are awakened to the power of God because church people live on the block. Because church people walk into the building. Can I tell you, a church who is committed to living in the zone will be identifiable. Because it's going to be the zone that is going to make the differentiation between those who are of the real church and those who are just in another club or click on the corner. In a world that loves glitz and glamour, where people chase after the wind and they worship the temporary. We got a real reality check that's getting ready to happen because not everyone is living as a part of God's royal family. Not everybody on this earth is God's child. And before you check out, let me just tell you what I mean because uh, to be a child of the Most High, we are all created by God, but not all of us are God's children. Because being God's child isn't a default setting. It is a decision that you have to make. Just because you're born doesn't mean that you are God's child. You have to decide, I want to give my life. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching today, but guess what? This is what he gave me. He said, tell them they got to be in the zone. If you're going to be a champion for me, you got to live in the zone. Being born into God's family is not by flesh, but you're born again by the spirit. We've heard that we've all, we are all God's children, and it sounds sweet. And we, we've heard even some preachers say, uh, uh, we're all God's children. And, but, 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 but let me just tell you the whole truth. Everybody's not living in the Father's house. Everybody's not a part of the kingdom. 
It's like saying that everybody that's in the hospital is a doctor, and we know that everybody that goes to the hospital is not a doctor. Everybody that goes to church is not a part of God's family. And it's time to distinguish between being God's creation and being God's chosen. Being born again is not just a makeover. Look at your person next to you and tell them God is not in the business of doing facelifts. He does heart transplants. Yeah, he's not just going to make you look like another person and make you look like a good. God is in the business of doing heart transplants. It's just like you being born into your family. When you are born into a family, you don't get to choose your parents. You, you get what you get when you're born into your family. If we were to choose, then, then we would probably do a, things a little bit different. I would have a little bit more hair rather than uh, not having any hair, but that's just what I got. My daddy got that, so I got it. But watch this. When you are adopted, when you're born, you don't get to choose your parents. But when you are adopted, your parents get to choose you. And the Bible says that we are not just born into God's family, but that we are adopted into his family, which means that God chose each and every one of us. He signed, sealed, and delivered his choice on your life. That no longer do I have to live a life wondering why didn't anybody choose me. The fact that you are a part of God's family just says, God says, I want that one. And I want that one. And I want that one. God chose us to be in his family. Somebody lift your hands and say, God, thank you for choosing me. Thank you for choosing me. Watch me, watch me. Being God's child means that I move from being on the guest list to being a part of the family tree. That I'm not a guest in the house anymore. But all of the privileges that go along with being a son, I get every one of them. But here's what it takes. Because living in the zone means that we've got to work at being and staying in the zone. So, so pastor, what does it take to be a champion in the power zone? W w number one, family, we've got to tune into the divine frequency if we're going to live in the zone. As, ask your neighbor, are you catching the whisper? Because in a nonstop world that's always plugged in, we've always got uh, uh, notifications and dings and pings going everywhere. In a world that is always plugged in, silence is a rare commodity. In other words, it is in the silence that the divine frequency is often found. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter number 19, verse 11 through 13, standing on the mountain before the Lord, he experienced this with the wind and the earthquake and the fire, but the Lord was not in any of that. The Lord uh, uh, was in a gentle, quiet whisper. This is a pivotal moment that underscores for us the truth about staying in the zone in our relationship with God, that God will not compete with with the clamor and all of the noise of your life to speak to you. That you've got to make the intention that I'm going to practice the quiet place. Elijah's encounter, watch this, shows us the importance of finding our own mountaintop quietness in our daily lives. Some people can't be quiet. They always got to be online. They come to church and they got to be online. If you in church, you don't need to be concerned about the people that's not in church. Because the world will offer all kinds of distractions. 
vying for our attention, but the voice of God is discerned not in the chaos, but it's in the quietness. It is that deliberate silencing of our outer noise that we can listen to the voice of God. That we get his direction in the zone. I don't know how true it is, but I heard this and, and I thought it was remarkable uh, that, that the quarterback for um, the, the team that just won the, the Super Bowl, who was it, the team that just, Kansas City, uh, Patrick Mahone, he, he is often found before a game in a quiet place praying to God. He's a Christian brother, praying to God before he plays his game, finding that quiet place, practicing listening and tuning in to the divine frequency that God wants to speak to us because the divine frequency is not catching a one-off where God speaks to you every now and then, but it's about cultivating a lifestyle of listening to God on a daily basis. It's about listening to God even when you're not in church. Yeah, oh, I had a good time in church. God spoke to me in church. But what about when you're on your job? And what about when you're in the mall? And what about when you're in your home? This means intentionally setting aside time and turning down the volume of our busy lives, developing the sensitivity to the Spirit's voice to guide us. This is how we begin to discern the voice, the whisper that often comes as a nudge, as an impression, as a scripture that automatically and sometimes suddenly is illuminated in our lives. It is the voice that speaks to us, the deepest part of us, aligning us with his will and his way. Some ways, sometimes I've been going and I heard that still small voice and said, no, don't go there. Sometimes I heard that still small voice and said, give this person a call. And they said, you called me at the right time. I, I, I was going through this situation and you called me. I'm so glad you called me. And I always say, God knows exactly what we need to hear when we need to hear it. It's learning to discern his voice in a world where other voices seek to draw us astray. Where other voices are seeking to capture our attention. So much so what we cannot hear what God is trying to say to us. Practicing this silence and listening for God requires patience. Somebody say patience. It, it, it requires a heart attuned to the spiritual realities that God's whispers carry transformative power. God says, I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to force myself on you, but you got to be in a place where you can hear me because there's some transformations that will only come by you hearing what God is trying to tell you. It redirects our path and reassures our hearts. It refreshes our spirits. This is the gentle voice that God will give us oftentimes in life's toughest decisions. Where you don't need to ask everybody, what y'all think? Let me know in the comments. No, I want to know what God is saying. Because it's God's voice that's going to comfort me in my darkest hour. It's God's voice that's going to give me the direction that I need for the moves that I got to make. Are y'all getting this? Because this world is full of noise. But God's voice will cut through like a hot knife through butter. Only if you're listening to hear what he has to say. What do I have to do? I got to turn down the volume so that I can hear Tim. I got to turn down the volume. I got to, I got to, I got to shut everything out so that I can hear him. So watch this. Also to stay in the zone, we have to number two, fine tune our hearts. Ask the person next to you, check your heart. Because tuning into the spirit's voice, meaning aligning your heart's antenna to the divine signal that God is trying to send. It's about setting your spirit 
and heart to spirit mode so that you can pick up the guidance that God is trying to give you in your life. The first step in getting your heart right is allowing the spirit to op do open heart surgery on you. Because many times we don't think that our heart needs to be changed. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. He said, who can know it? God says, I know your heart. Men may look on the outer appearance, but I know the deep parts of you. This isn't a physical procedure, but this is a spiritual one. And I like Ezekiel chapter 36 and 26 because it talks about God removing the stony, stubborn parts of our heart and replacing it with the heart of flesh that's responsive to God's movements, God's direction. God's desires that where I would do it, I don't do it because my heart has been changed. Where I would say it, I don't say it because guess what? I got to follow what God has given me in my heart. Heart tuning means desire realignment because often our desires dictate the direction of our lives. I'm going to say that again. Our desires often dictate the direction of our lives. To get our hearts right, we must go through a realignment of our desires where our priorities are this. I prioritize what God prioritizes and I love what God loves and I do and act according to the way that God wants me to do and to act. This is the process of defining and uprooting what it is that God says is not like him. When is the last time you had to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God and God showed you this is something that you got to get out your heart? This is something that I, I, I want you to uproot from your heart and, 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 and look at the desires that are leading you away from me and cultivate the desires that are drawing you closer to me. Because watch this. It is in this journey that we move from self-centered desires to God-centered desires. That I move from, I'm just trying to please God. I'm not trying to be better than anybody else. I'm just trying to please God. I'm not trying to show up anybody else. I'm just trying to please God. The reason why I pray, the reason why I praise, the reason why I walk in love, I just have to please God in everything that I say and everything that I do. My prayer is not my will, but thy will be done in every area of my life. And guess what? This submission is not passive, but it's active. In other words, it's a daily decision that I'm choosing to follow God's heart. It's a daily decision that I'm checking my heart. I'm, a, I'm aligning my heart, even when it's challenging, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's countercultural. I got to do what God desires for me to do. Tell the person next to you, don't just follow your heart. Lead your heart. Lead your heart into the presence of God. Lead your heart in, in, into the ways of God. Mold it and shape it and tune it until it beats with the rhythm of the Spirit of God. Because when I start living in the zone, not only do I fine-tune my heart, but I then start operating in immediate obedience. Somebody say immediate obedience. Watch this. When the Spirit speaks, He's not tossing suggestions our way. He's giving us directives that are to be followed. We've, we live in a day where people believe that Christianity is a democracy. That I get to say... I get to uh, 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 explain what I think should be and should not be. But it's not a democracy. It's a theocracy where God's voice has the final say. 
where you hear what God says, you heed what he says, and you hustle to complete what he says. The only thing that I got to do is hear from God, I got to obey from God, and I got to do what God tells me to do. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't drop hints. He de delivers commands. And when he speaks, he's not looking for your nod. Like, okay, it's all right. He's looking for you to obey what he is saying for you to do. He says, don't just nod, move to what I'm telling you to do. Because watch this, delaying is disobedience. That if I hear his call, the time for me to act is not when I think about it, not when I talk to somebody else about it, not when I look and see, well, what does it look like in the culture for me to do what he said? The time for me to act and do what God says do is right now. When the Holy Spirit gives you a, a command, he's not looking for feedback, he's looking for follow through. He's looking for you to say, okay, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Immediate obedience is the only kind of obedience. It's about recognizing and submitting. It's about action. Because what we fail to understand is that when I live in immediate, immediate obedience, it transforms my spiritual walk from a leisure stroll into a purpose-driven journey. In other words, it turns my path into a high-speed highway where God says, all, all you're going to do is obey me. I'm going to make sure I open up the pathway for you. And that is where the blessings of God comes because every yes to God accelerates your progress toward your divine destiny. There are those that are listening to me and wondering, why haven't I made it? Why haven't I gotten this? And God is saying, check your obedience because the moment you start obeying what I've told you to do, that's when I'm going to unlock the blessings that I said I have for you. That's when I'm going to unlock every door that I said I would open for you. The breakthrough and divine favor that is over your life. It's not you earning God's love. It's about you lining up and positioning yourself to the things that God says are already yours. When you move at the impulse of God, you step into the flow of his grace and his provision. You ain't got to hate on nobody that's getting blessed. You ain't got to look at nobody up and down and tell them, well, it don't take all of that. All you got to do is obey God. When you obey God, God says, I'll open doors that no man can close. He says, I'll make the pathway straight for you. He says, I'll cause men to uh, bless you. I'll cause men to do things for you. I'll cause men to give you things that I said belong to you. When you obey me, he says, I'll be the one that'll make sure that every promise that I made in your life comes to pass. But it starts with your obedience. Because watch this, obedience is the highest form of faith. Because it shows you trust God, not just with your eternity, but you trust God with your every day. Yeah, I know I'm going to he heaven and I got I to gotta please God to go to heaven, but do you tr trust God to work on your job? Do you trust God to raise your children? Do you trust God to handle your finances? Do you trust God to give you the promotion that you desire? Do you trust God with everything that you have? It's the highest form of faith because you prove that your faith is not theoretical, but you prove that your faith is practical and powerful and life-changing, causing you to live every single day of your life in the zone. The people wonder, 
what, what's going on? They're just in the zone. How are they making it? I'm in the zone. And watch this. Lastly, to live in the zone, we've got to follow the step-by-step -step navigation. Somebody say step-by-step -step step navigation. The Holy Spirit's guidance is like your spiritual GPS giving you just enough light for the next step. I was talking to somebody last night and, and encouraging them, and they said, my problem is I want to know the whole plan all at once. And I said, well, what God does is he gives you enough light just for the next step. When you take the next step and obey what he tells you, then he gives you enough light for the next step after that. The process is not about God withholding information from you, but it's inviting us to a deeper trust and dependence on God. If God gave you the whole plan, you would probably not want to obey what he tells you to do. If the man that was blind and he knew that Jesus had to spit in some clay and put it on his eyes, if he knew that ahead of time, he probably wouldn't have allowed Jesus to spit and put it on his eyes. But the fact that Jesus says, I'm going to do this one step and then I'm going to allow you to get the next step. God will not show you the whole plan all at once because he knows if I show you everything that I have for you, if I opened up and showed you every blessing that I have for you, every deliverance I have for you, he knows we would not be able to handle it. We would squander it. We would blow it. Some of us would cower, get scared, and run away. Say, I, I, uh, I'm not signing up for that. But it is in this journey of following his step-by-steps guidance that shifts our focus from obsessing over the destination to embracing the journey that he has us on. Because when we embrace the journey that he has us on, that is when we begin to grow and we begin to be and develop what he wants us to be. This kind of guidance fosters an intimate relationship with God. And that's why it requires constant communication with him and sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. We're listening and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The text that we read said that you don't have to live according to your flesh. Now that you have gotten the Holy Ghost and you've got this guidance, you don't live according to your flesh because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the Spirit, there will be life everlasting for you. Too many people are living according to their flesh what I feel like, what I think, how it makes me feel. Anything that I can do in this natural arena to relieve myself from living in the zone, I want to do it. But the closer we walk with God, the clearer his guidance becomes revealing our next steps and protecting us from being overwhelmed by the bigness of the plan that he has for us. Yeah. It protects us from being overwhelmed by everything that he wants and have called us to. It's his way of saying, you focus on what I'm telling you to focus on. I'll focus on the big part because I know the plans that I have for you. I know the end result. I know what it's going to look like in the end. You can't handle the end right now. You just focus on this step right here. And when you focus on that, then I'm going to open up everything else to you. Every step of obedience prepares us for what's coming next. It seems like at times a detour. It seems like we're being delayed. It seems like God has forgotten about us, but God says, you just follow my plan. 
Because this is oftentimes the training ground that equips us for the future challenges that we will face. There have been some things in my life, had I not gone through some of the challenges and struggles that I went through before, when I got to the place that I got, I wouldn't have been able to make it. But I'm thankful that God didn't just open up and say, here's your blessing, here's everything that I have for you, but he let me go through a training ground because it's through the training ground that we learn how to depend. We learn how to develop. We learn how to turn the cheeks. That we don't have to respond every time somebody says something. That the knockdown don't have to be a knockout. That I can take the blows and I can keep on going forward. This is why we have to live in the power zone. Because when you live in the power zone, then you live in the promises of God. When you live in the zone, you live in the protection of God. When you live in the zone, you walk by faith and not by sight. When you live in the zone, you count it all joy when you fall in divers tests and trials. When you live in the zone, you know, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you live in the zone, you can lay hands on your own family and your own children and your own relatives and you know they shall recover when you live in the zone you will walk in the enemy's camp and you will take everything that he stole from you when you live in the zone you know if God be for me he's more than the world who is against me when you live in the zone you will declare as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord Tell two people, I'm in the zone. I'm in the zone. Because when I'm in the zone, I'm seated in heavenly places. When I'm in the zone, the evil one cannot touch me. When I'm in the zone, I tear down strongholds. When I'm in the zone, I cause every devil to tremble when I wake up. When I'm in the zone, there is nothing that the enemy can do to stop me when I'm in the zone. I'm a champion that's in the zone. I'm a kingdom champion that's in the zone. And when he opens the door, there's no devil that can shut the door. When I'm in the zone, there is nothing that will be able to hinder and stop me when I'm in the zone. Watch this. When I'm, on, when I'm in the zone, I'm not just on a spiritual journey. I'm not just on a stroll through this thing called life, but I'm being led by the Spirit every single day of my life. All of my decisions are led by the Spirit. It's more than just arriving. It's thriving under the Holy Spirit's direction. I'm not sinking, I'm not surviving, I'm thriving when I'm in the zone under the Holy Spirit's direction. But I got to choose to listen to that still small voice. I got to surrender my plans to his plan. If I'm going to be a champion, I got to undergo a transformation on the inside of myself. I got to get to the point where things that I used to do, I don't do them no more. Not because I can't do them, but because I choose I don't want to do them. Yes. Family, it's time to live in the zone where our fear is silenced and our faith is amplified. Because our future is so bright, we got to wear heavenly shades. Because God has so much in store for us. Let the Holy Spirit lead us. And we will never be led astray. Stand with me all over this building. Every single person under the sound of my voice, those that are watching, those that are online, every one of us 
who are a part of God's family, God has called us a champion of the faith. He's given us the tools that we need that we will to be victorious. But it's going to take the right mindset. It's going to take the right resolve. And it's going to take the leading and guiding of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us. 